Well, good morning, Cornerstone, and Happy New Year uh, to you, 2022. And, you know, the whole world is going through the same shenanigans as uh, New Year last year. Everybody said, goodbye, 2020. Woohoo, 2021, where it's all going to change. And... Um, the evidence would be initially that it's not going to change. In fact, um, the globalist elite are going to double down, if nothing else. So get ready, brothers and sisters. I think we're in for a rough, rough ride this year. And if you are not prepared for tribulation and persecution, then uh, it is going to catch you because this is going to be a difficult year. That's why I've been saying recently, do whatever you can to get out of debt. Uh, because debt is, you know, the, the principle of debt is that the borrower is servant to the lender. So this means that uh, you and I can easily be manipulated over our debts. And... Um, that is that is a serious problem. Um, so I would encourage you to do whatever you can to reduce your debt. And there is a a belief that mortgages, etc., are not a um, not a bad debt. Uh, in terms of investment wise, a mortgage. I guess enables you to enter into a market in which there is this constant capital growth and over time gives you a return. Um, and so in that way, sorry, I, I sprayed some antiseptic spray in my nose and um, it is, um, you know, just causing things to be a, a little uncomfortable at the moment. So I'll try not to um, be too focused on that. But in, in terms of Investment so mortgages can seem good over over a period of time that they you invest a certain amount of money and over a period of time you get a, a return on that a doubling or an increase and <coughs> you're able to see a dividend come from that um, you know which all sounds good but in the meantime um, many people who enter into a mortgage will attest to the problematic side. And that is that the mortgage, or as the word means, death grip, has a hold of you. And so all of the decisions that you make are made in the light of that mortgage. And so, you know, the, the employment and all these kinds of things. So in that way, um, because we've borrowed, we become a servant to the one who lends. So we're, we're sort of bound into that. And... Under normal circumstances, we can get by with that because the, over the period of time, we can pay down the mortgage and end up owning the asset. But in a period of time in which you have to make certain choices to keep your job, that then becomes a, an incredible burden hanging around your neck. And so in that way, instantly, and, you know, whether you're going to hang on to your business because you've invested a lot of money into it, um, which is going to provide for people, or whether you're going to hang on to your home, um, hang on to your job, all of these things um, are often centered around the issue of, um, you know, financial encumbrance. And so I think the, the um, wisdom of the moment is to try to reduce debt as much as possible and really if we've left it to now we've probably left it far too late and so um, now let's open in a word of prayer and then we will look into 1 Timothy uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 today and I just want to briefly look into a subject here this morning uh, love from a pure heart and then we will um, uh, you know, open it up for discussion afterwards, wherever you're meeting. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for 
all that you've done for us. Thank you for the love and the grace that you have bestowed on us. Lord, we thank you for the creation you've put around us, which is so beautiful, Lord, and we can look to that creation and we can see that your handiwork in it and it speaks and testifies of you. And so we praise you, Lord, that one of the things that creation shows us about you is creativity and beauty uh, and harmony. Lord, we thank you for this and we praise you that we can see in your creation aspects of your character. We thank you, Lord, for your um, uh, loving gift of your son, that you would give your son for us to die in our place. And so we praise you, Lord. We praise you that Yeshua, the Messiah, came to earth, willingly sacrificed himself, went, and as the scripture records, he, he turned his face, set his face like flint toward Jerusalem, knowing the persecution that lay ahead of him. And so we praise you for this, this modeling of courage in times of persecution. Help us, Lord, to set our face like flint toward your purpose. In the mighty name of Yeshua, your son. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, 1 Timothy 1, we will read there. And, you know, recently there have been some discussions um, in, in our Telegram groups. And um, these discussions have highlighted something that is important. And I had a wonderful conversation yesterday uh, with one of the brothers in our church. Um, who didn't shy away also from from um, sharing with me my failings in this and and that was that was really instructive and so it it got me to thinking about the principle one of the principles of brotherly love is that we edify one another and um, so I want to address that principle this morning you know and and address that that issue that um, at the heart of sound doctrine is the production of love to the edifying of one another. So let's read in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God our Saviour and of Jesus Christ our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So um, Paul, once again, having to remind people of his apostleship and um, part of the reason for this, uh, this need was the constant attack upon Paul that took place everywhere he went. Uh, just this constant uh, attack upon his ministry and the credibility of his ministry. But this didn't come from the other apostles. This came from outside, from people invading the work that God was doing through Paul's ministry. Verse 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Or another translation says any other doctrine. Nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Sorry, just going to uh, get rid of something floating around the background. Um, let me just get back to this. Nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than, rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Now, that's important. Um, we... We see this as a found, like what, what Paul is saying here is a foundational statement. He says, charge people not to teach other doctrines. And so the Acts 2 uh, says to us that when the, the new believers were uh, introduced to the Christian faith, that they were then shaped with the apostles' doctrine. And so this, I believe, is what Paul 
is foc focusing on the Apostles' Doctrine, which is centered around salvation by grace through faith and the, the deity of Yeshua the Messiah. So, this raises a, a, a lot of issues, this passage, because it raises a lot of questions about what were um, myths and what were endless genealogies and um, what were speculations, you know, what, what speculations were promoted out of this. Um, and so then he says, so here's a guiding principle for the doctrines that we do want taught. Verse 5, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussions, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just. And who are the just? The just are those who are saved by grace through faith. Right? Um, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So over the years at CGC, there's, we've had a lot of talk on, on false teachers and false teachings, and um, uh, we spent a lot of time following that on talking about how to rightly discern scripture and reading scripture in context. At some stages, we have focused on uh, particular teachers and movements. Um, we, we gave a lot of issue back in the day to the Toronto and Pensacola movements. Um, we focused uh, for some time on, uh, or gave some messages at least to Bethel and the heresies um, coming out of um, Bill, um, whatever his name is, uh, his movement there. But the majority has not been to focus on individuals, but to focus on the principle of an error, the, the underlying teaching that is at the root of erroneous behavior, and then teach the biblical principle that preserves us from those kinds of errors. And I want to stay in that lane today, as I believe that that is an effective lane. And, you know, the pitch that's often given uh, to people in order to become a Christian is such an appealing one. If you surrender to Jesus, everything's going to be great. And we hear that in some amazing testimonies, don't, don't we? When you hear people's public testimonies of how their lives were turned from, um, you know, whatever it might have been, from uh, drug addiction um, and, uh, you know, uh, alcohol addiction or to lives of crime, uh, from lives of crime, um, and lives of violence and things like this. And then they became Christians and life suddenly had meaning and purpose and, um, everything became awesome. And, um, as a result, they restored their marriage and their family and all these kinds of things, you know, the, that we, we hear these types of things. And those are true stories in many cases. They are very true stories of what Jesus has done. But but the, the way that's presented to people is that if you surrender to Jesus, everything will be fine. But we know, in actual fact, the Christian life is fraught with difficulty and challenge. It, it is a life that has at its heart... Um, persecution and tribulation and there are challenges and obstacles along the way and it's only really uh, the Western church with its focus upon um, comfort 
that has been afforded it through the foundational documents of those nations, that we've become used to uh, lives of comfort. And as a consequence, we believe that, you know, the, the word of faith movements and things like this have come in, uh, teaching the kingdom now principles of, of uh, victorious living right here, right now. Um, and they've mistaken uh, victorious living with comfortable living and that anyone who's facing persecution must be lacking faith. Um, anyone who's facing disease must be lacking faith. Um, these kinds of things. And so, you know, th these ideas have invaded the church because we are essentially a hedonistic society now in love with pleasure. Um, the church is only a step apart from that. We just maybe love some different pleasures. And so this has, um, you know, this has all been part of the, the challenge of the gospel message, or, or this has been a challenge to the way the gospel is preached. Because if we preach the gospel in a method that says, come to Jesus and life will be love, peace and happy juice, and people come to Jesus and life is um, tribulation, trial and persecution, um, they're going to feel ripped off, and rightly so, because the messenger indeed has sold them a bill of goods. And one need for the church is that with these challenges that come along with the Christian life, right? So when we present the gospel properly, people come into the Christian life understanding that the Christian life has with it inherent challenges. And, um, and these challenges that come to us many times are the very shaping mechanisms by which God shapes and molds your life and builds within you character to um, persevere. So when we think about the present circumstances, there is persecution coming against the church by um, governments within Australia who have aligned themselves with ideologies that are anti-Christian. And this is despite the foundational documents of this country uh, preserving and protecting rights for those who follow Christ. Um, indeed, those, those rights are preserved and protected for religion. Religion was understood when the Constitution was written to be Christianity. Um, and I say that in the broad sense of, of Catholic and Protestant. And that was largely the accepted view that they were Christian religions. I have some issues with that broad term, but that's another, another subject. That was the way the Constitution was framed, that the idea of religion was essentially Christianity in the broad term. It, but even if it's not taken that way, even if it is just taken to mean all kinds of religions, um, the, there are protections for religions within our foundational documents. And despite this, we have now obstacles. We've got persecution coming against us from uh, state and federal governments who are opposed to these foundational principles. So that is persecution from without coming in. And that's okay. Now, we can resist um, lawfully. We can challenge these things. We can stand for our um, rights as citizens um, within lawful, lawful mechanisms and we can appeal and lobby for change to the way states are heading and territories are heading, all of that kind of thing. All of that is okay, lawfully. But it is one thing for us to have persecution and tribulation coming from outside without, right? Coming from outside to the inside. So persecution from outside the church to the church. But we need to keep on the right side of the battle lines. And what we shouldn't be doing is persecuting one another over small things.
We don't need to be battling with one another in times like these or among one another in times like these. Verse 3, as I urged you when, you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any other doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Now, false teachers are always busy trying to capture Christians. There is a, a target among um, false Christians, of false teachers, to, to market themselves into the Christian world because the Christian world is of essence a powerful community because the power of Christianity is not rooted in a building. It's not rooted in the establishment of a, um, a denomination. The power of Christianity is rooted in the message we preach. That's where it is. What does Paul say in Romans chapter 1? I'll read it out so we get the... The wording, this is in the ESV. Romans 1. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Or the just shall live by faith. So, um, this is why Christian doctrine and the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith is so constantly under assault. Um, and it comes from the pseudo Christian community, uh, the, the community that um, does not hold to foundational beliefs. It comes from there and it attacks the foundational teachings of Christianity. False teachers always try to capture Christians. And, um, and this is the reason why. Because the gospel results in liberty. It results in individual freedom and individual power um, that, that the believer that is nestled in the believer's life, that they end up with power to live their individual life. and um, But not to live it individually. But So it's not individualism, um, you know, a separation. But, but you become, as a, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you individually are empowered to live for God. And if you're going to neuter Christianity, therefore, you have to attack that gospel message because that is where the the pillar and the ground of truth is, is in the foundational teachings. Who is Jesus and why did he come to earth and um, uh, what were the elements of his death, burial and resurrection? These kinds of things. That was good. So Christianity is a collection of teachings and these teachings are enacted upon um, so Paul gave Timothy orders he says look I want you to stay at Ephesus and charge people not to teach any other doctrine now I can hear an amen coming from uh, among some of us you know as if Paul is endorsing what you're saying and this is not Paul endorsing you this is Paul saying to Timothy, I want you to endorse the Apostles' Doctrine. I want you to do that. And I want you to charge these men that they endorse the Apostles' Doctrine. So it's not Paul endorsing you and I. This is Paul commanding Timothy to charge people to keep that doctrine. And this is really important for us, church, that we understand this, that we get this the right way around. And one of the importances of this is that 
we are to remain humble before God so that our doctrine is um, is um, uh, constantly surveyable might be the word it's 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 not ever changing but that we can hold on to truth to the degree that we know it and then as that truth is enlarged we can hold on to that as well that we're not so cloistered in to um, a, a collection of ideas that we are without the potential for growth and development but at the same time we're not swayed by every wind of doctrine and so because I would say that the church today has veered so far from the apostles doctrine by and large we've veered so far from that and from the way in which the early church was living that um, that we do not necessarily understand um, others and so you know, we, we don't necessarily understand how the early church was um, functioning. But Paul says all of this, he, he says all of this with verse 5 as being the, the guidance of this. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience and a sincere faith. That's the aim of this charging of people. That's the aim of the charge. That he gives him. Remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any other doctrine. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart, good conscience, and sincere faith. Now, this would therefore be the guiding principle of when you and I engage with one another, whether it's in a phone call, um, you know, oh, it's back to front. Someone's going to say that on the internet. It wasn't really a phone call. He had his phone back to front. Um, yeah, so I just thought as I was picking it up, I should have made sure the volume was turned off because I don't want it dinging in the background. Whether So whether it's a phone call, whether we are engaging with one another on Telegram, um, Facebook, uh, messaging one another um, in group chats, all these kinds of things. Love from a pure heart is to be at the core of that. Love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. So this is a great test to us, isn't it? Paul's aim was to produce love. That is it. So the question then becomes is, what is what I'm doing, the question is, is what I'm doing promoting love in this way? Love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And this should be at the heart of all of our conversations. And this means we can approach difficult subjects in the right way. Right, um, I believe that maybe throughout the last couple of years, I may have personally fermented uh, some of the rhetoric that has gone around, and I I want to apologise for that. Um, you know, in the event that I've done that, um, and wherever I've done that, I'm I'm sure I have. I know I have. Um, I want to apologise for that. I don't think I have, um, yeah, anyway, I won't get into it. That's just a sinkhole if I go down that road. Um, but the major issue is out of this is think and pray first. Is love at the root of what I'm saying, you're saying? Is love at the root of that, of what you are saying? Is love at the root of how you're saying it? And is love at the root of why you're saying it? What you say, how you say it, and why you say it. And I think that this 
can give you some guidance because then you can sort of sit back from it before the conversation starts and ask yourself, why am I doing this? How should I do this? And what, what do I want to say? Why do I want to say it? And how can I say this? If the purpose is to be, um, you know, like to follow the um, media pattern of shock jocking, now, and that happens on both sides, right? Um, people on the left, they say, if we don't do something now, the world will be ended by 2024. Um, I think it was 2012. I think it was 1990 something. You know, they, they've done this over and over again. The world is going to end. It's shock jockeying. Um, and, and so, you know, the message is, is intended to shock. There are times that a, that a message may shock people in the right sense, but still at the root of that, we, we have to ask, is what I'm saying correct? And is how I'm saying it correct? And is why I'm saying it correct? So Paul says to the church, charge people not to teach any other doctrine nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. So the charge is not without purpose. So the purpose is not about the, the subject matters being taught. This, the purpose is to produce love. And this is really important. So, so when, we, when we have at the root, let's say we were within a, 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 um, uh, oh man, the word is just gone. A denominational structure and the dominant denominational structure had teachings a b and c and somebody wanted to discuss teaching d teaching d might have a lot of great information to it and may expand people's faith and devotion to christ but if the denominational structure is such that that can't be taught then there is a closeting of people's minds and a pigeonholing of their minds into certain areas so the issue becomes within that structure, how, why do we want to teach this? How should we teach it? And what is the, you know, what is the, um, uh, the, the purpose for teaching it, you know? Um, so, you know, that's, that's the issue there. So Paul, Paul is saying to Timothy, look, the, you know, primary, to the charge is actually the production of love. It is not the riddance of these doctrines. I get the feeling from this passage that first of all, as much as Paul hits on the issue of these doctrines, his main thing, the aim of our charge is to produce love from a pure heart, a good conscience and a sincere faith. And I, I believe that Paul is saying, once love is the product, these other things will take care of themselves. You know, that doesn't mean there won't be contention or difficulty within the structure of that church fellowship at Ephesus. But the actions of all involved in the Christian faith are to stem from love. Love rooted in a pure heart, good conscience and sincere faith. Now, only you and I can answer the question sincerely of what is our motivation. When we discuss things in open channels of communication, whether it's um, you know on, on social media, Telegram, etc., we have to remember that there are people of all backgrounds and maturity levels, and there are some things that need to be approached in different ways, and it may, um, uh, you know, and th there are methods of um, rhetoric. That, that may have to be avoided. So if you see an article, let's say, for example, um, online, and you share it straight to the church, one of the church communications, um, and that article is denigrating people who um, have been held on to a certain belief and calling them by a pejorative term, that's not in the best interest of anybody. So, you know, 
um, it was highlighted in the discussion yesterday that at times people have promoted things um, in our discussion groups that have called people sheeple, um, that have called people idiots, uh, these kinds of things. You know, of course, that Omicron is an anagram for moronic, um, you know, as if, the, the and which is entertaining and I don't think really should be offensive to anyone, but if we, if we conclude that somehow people are uh, moronic for having um, a certain belief, then, then we're using a pejorative term without consideration to them. We're not considering, considering their circumstances or their motivations um, or their understanding at the time. Time may have revealed a lot more to them. At that time, people made a decision and time may have revealed that that decision was right or wrong. If I, if I caught a certain disease and died from that disease, I may afterwards, if I was, if I was granted a second chance, said, oh, I think that was wrong the way I handled that disease. So, um, so the idea of calling a brother or a sister or, or labeling them into a group that that of morons or idiots that should be terrible to us because what that does is it does not engage one another in a conversation that helps one another now that's not what paul was hitting at he was going onto this issue of fables and endless genealogies and that really is a subject for another time but essentially the the judaizers who were following paul around um they were um, uh, false teachers who were sort of mounting their argument on Old Testament law and the genealogies of the tribes and these kinds of things. And they were manufacturing all kinds of beliefs and doctrinal beliefs um, so as to put people in exclusion categories and destabilize people's faith in Jesus Christ, that their salvation by grace through faith and to lead people into a, an, an abiding in the law. Um, and so they were raising questions and not answering them. Um, you know, um, they weren't promoting salvation by grace through faith. They were leading people away from that and into the bondage of legalism. And this does not produce love, purity, and a good conscience and sincere faith. Um, this, in fact, takes people back into the bondage that Israel was in before under the law. And this is destructive. So these novel doctrines were causing division. They were causing hypocrisy and causing problems within the body of the church. So this doesn't mean that Paul was evading topics. He wasn't asking people not, not to talk about difficult topics. And even as a church, we have talked about difficult topics. But as important as the topic may be, the motivation for it, the method for approaching it, these kinds of things are just as important. So, look, I'll, I'll continue this next week, but let's just read verses 3 to 11 as we close out, because I think I've gone uh, long enough here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Now, the speculation is not um, it, I'll come back to that. I'll try and come back to that next week. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and pro profane, 
for those who strike their fathers and mothers for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So a couple of questions to leave you with is, what are your motivations for engaging with brothers and sisters? And before you start thinking, oh, this would be really good for so-and-so or so-and-so or so-and-so, aim this question at yourself. What are your motivations for engaging with brothers and sisters? What should be our motivations based on the text? Is it simple to, um, you know, is it, is it, are, are we simply trying to prove ourselves better than others? Are we trying to prove ourselves more knowledgeable than others? Are we trying to cause um, the destabilizing of people's faith? Um, or is your concern to see a development of love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith? That There's a guideline for living. Amen. God bless you today and I'll leave you with those questions and we shall see each other soon.